You see me here before you. I am Poseidon. I have left the salt depths of the Aegean Sea, where sea nymphs trace the fairest coral dance with their eddying feet. From that time when Apollo and I built stone towers to enclose this city with straight plum lines, never has affection for this Phrygian city been absent from my heart. The city now smolders. It has been sacked and destroyed by the spear of the Argives. It was Epios of Phocis under Parnassos who, inspired by the stratagem of Athena, fashioned a horse pregnant with armed soldiers and sent it within these walls with its cargo of death. Deserted now are the sacred groves of the gods. Their great temples drip with blood. King Priam has fallen at the steps of the altar of Zeus of the enclosure. He lies there, dead. Great quantities of gold and plunder from Phrygia are now being carried down to the ships of the Achaeans, who wait for a wind from the east to carry them in the tenth year of sowing to the long foresight of their wives and children. These are the Greeks who made the expedition against this city. I too am leaving fabled Ilion and my altars. I have been defeated by Hera, goddess of Argos, and by Athena, who together combined to destroy the Phrygians. When a terrible desolation takes a city, the world of the gods sickens and will not receive its honors. The river's commander echoes the laments of the captured women who have been assigned by lot to their new owners. They have been reserved for the great men of the army. Among them is Helen, daughter of Tenderios, a woman from Laconia, now properly a captive bride. And this poor creature, if you can bear to look at her, lies stretched out before the gates. Her daughter, Polixena, has been put to death at the mound of Achilles' grave, a terrible death she does not know of. The children of Priam and Hecuba are no more. The daughter, Lord Apollo, cursed in her frenzy, still a virgin, Agamemnon has married by brute force in an adulterous bed, violating both the god's property and the piety due to him. I have said enough. I say farewell to my city, once fortunate in its dressed stone towers. You would still be standing firm on your foundations if Athena, daughter of Zeus, had not destroyed you. <coughs> Can I speak to you? A great divinity and a god honored among the gods, who in birth is closest to my father. Can I abandon the enmity that has separated us? Lady Athena, you can. Conversation among kin is a powerful drug over the mind. I commend your moderate attitude. I come to you on matters that concern us both. And my lord, I will be open with you. Do you not bring some new message from the gods, from Zeus or another god? No. I come on account of Troy, the city on whose walls we stand, to make a claim on your power. Can this be? Have you cast aside the hatred you once held for this city? Have you come to pity it now that it's in ashes? First, come over here. Can we now speak with one another? Will you agree to do what I want done? Indeed, I will. But I would like to know what you have in mind first. Have you come on account of the Achaeans or the Phrygians? I want to cheer the Trojans, who were once my enemies. I want to inflict upon the Achaean army a homecoming that will be bittersweet. Tell me, how can you leap from one emotion to its opposite? 
how rapidly you shift from extremes of hate to extremes of love. Are you unaware that I and my temples have been outraged? I am aware of this outrage. I knew of it the moment Ajax began to drag Cassandra from your temples by force. And the Achaeans did not lift a finger or utter a word against him. And yet it was thanks to your power that they sacked Ilion. Yes! And with your help, I want to do them harm. I am ready to help you as I can. What do you want me to do? I want you to inflict upon them a homecoming that will be bittersweet. While they are still on land or upon the salt sea. Once they have left Ilion and have set sail for home, Zeus will hurl down upon them rain and hail unceasing and sable blast from the height of heaven. He promises me the fiery bolt of lightning to strike the Achaeans and burn their ships in a blaze of fire. Now for your part, Poseidon. Make the sea waves of the Aegean roar with waves and white caps and swirling water. Choke the hollow of your bow with corpses. Teach the Achaeans to respect my palaces in the future and to revere the other gods. This shall be accomplished. I will roil up the salt expanses of the Aegean Sea, the capes of Mykonos and the reefs of Delos. Skyros, Lemnos, and the Caffarian promontories will receive the corpses of many dead men. You, Athena, go up to Olympus. Take the lightning bolt from your father's hand and bide your time. Wait until the army of the Achaeans is under full sail. That mortal is a fool who destroys a city, its temples, its tombs, and the precincts of the dead, making them a waste. He will be destroyed himself. even direct the prow of my life against the wave. <laughs> Why should I not grow out in this inarticulate misery? Gone are my country, my husband, my children. Oh, great billowing glory of my ancestors, you collapse to this? So you amounted to nothing after all. Why should I remain silent? Why should I speak out? Why should I raise the cry of lamentation? I groan over this body, contorted by the weight of some heavy god. I lie with my back stretched out on this hard bed. Oh, how I long to roll and toss and surrender my back and spine to both walls like a ship's keel rocking from side to side, pursuing strain after strain of lamentation and tears. To the unfortunate, even lamentation is a muse. To death's misfortunes no chorus can dance to. You ship's prows coming to sacred Ilion, propelled by swift oars over the indigo sea, passing by the safe harbors of Greece and accompanied by the hateful anthem to Apollo, the pian, and the voice of melodious pipes. You ship sterns, fitted by the cultured and plated papyrus of Egypt, you came to Troy's heartland in pursuit of the loathed wife of Menelaus, the shame of her brother Castor, the infamy of the river Eurotus, the woman who slaughters Priam, Priam who sowed the seed of 50 children, who slaughters 
lost her sorrow in Hecuba. She had run higher ground on the beach of this ruin. Enough. Enough. You, pitiful wives of Trojan husbands who were once armed with bronze swords, daughters ill-wed, brides of death, join me in my wailing. Troy smolders. I, a mother, will lead the piercing keening, sorrowful as the lament of a feathered bird. But not as I once did, when I had the support of Priam's scepter and led the dance in a stately rhythm to honor the gods of Phrygia. Hecuba, why do you cry out? What makes you utter these words? Where has your tale taken us? We heard the wail of lamentation that pierced our chambers, piercing our breasts with fear starting dread for the women of Troy. In these dwellings they grieve over their enslavement. My children, let me answer. Sailors with oars gripped in their hands are setting off for the ships of the Achaeans. Oh! What, what do they mean to do? Will they really carry me from my country over the sea? I do not know. I guess that some disaster is at hand. <laughs> Poor women of Troy, hear now your hard fate. You will be taken from your homes by ship. The Argives are preparing to return home. No, 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 do not let her come out. Wild, frenzied Cassandra, dervish, minded, shame to the Argives. Do not inflict more pain upon me. Oh, Troy, unhappy Troy, you are no more. Unhappy are those who leave you, the living and the dead. Uh, my queen, trembling in fear, I have left this tent of Agamemnon to hear what you have to say. Have the Argives then decided to put us to death, though we are already wretched? Or are the sailors standing at the ship's sterns, ready to ply their oars? My children, I have come in fright, my soul awakened by the great dawn of terror. Has a herald from the camp of the Danaeans already come? To whom have I been allotted as a miserable slave? Your lot, I think soon to fall. Oh, which Argive, which Thessalian will take me away? Or will I be taken to some island far from Troy? Oh, who will be my master? Where on earth shall I end up as a slave in my suffering and old age? A drudge, a crone, the counterfeit of a corpse? the gold statue of a dead woman. Shall I, who was once honored as a queen of Troy, serve as a doorkeeper or a nurse to another's children? Oh, what inarticulate sounds could you summon to grieve over this black day? Never again will I push the shuttle along the frame of looms cut from the trees of Mount Ida. Now, for a last time, will I look at the home of my parents. Still greater hardships than this await me. I will be forced to share a bed with a Greek. Keep that night and spirit of evil far from me. Or will I carry water as a pitiable servant from the sacred stream of Pyrene? Could I have my wish, I would go to the renowned, blessed, and prosperous land of Theseus. But never would I go to the eddies of the Erotus, hateful river that nurtured Helen, where I would encounter now a slave, Menelaus, the sacker of Troy. 
I have heard rumors of the stately land of Thessaly, watered by the river Peneus, the fairest approach to high Olympus. I have heard of its fertility, richness, and knotty crops. After the sacred land of Theseus, inhabited by gods, this is the land I would choose. I have heard of the land of Mount Edna, sacred to Ephesus, a land that faces the country of the Phoenicians, the mother to the hills of Sicily. I have heard of a land proclaimed by the reeds of victory, a land that lies closest to the sailor crossing the Ionian Sea, a land watered by the fairest of all rivers, the Crathus, that flows in streams that turn hair to a ruddy hue, as its divine springs foster and make crops for this powerful, populous land. Now, here comes the herald from the army of the Danaeans to the spits from his store, still new tales. He comes in a great hurry. What news is he bringing? What will he tell us? I know, we are already slaves of a Dorian land. <laughs> Hecuba, you know who I am, woman. I am familiar to you from the many times I have come in the past to Troy from the Achaean army. I am Talthibius, and I come with something new to tell. This, this, dear women, is what I have long feared. You have already been allotted to your master, if that is what you feared. To what city did you say I am to be taken? A city in the land of Dithiotis, in Thessaly? A city of Cadmos land? Each of you has already been allotted to her master. You have not been given as a group. Tell me, who are the winners in this lottery? What happy lot awaits the women of Troy? I can tell you, but one question at a time, not all at once. Then tell me, who was awarded my daughter for suffering Cassandra? Lord Agamemnon chose her from the rest, reserving her for himself. So, to serve as a slave for his Spartan bride. No, not as a slave, but a bride to share his bed in secret. So, he took the virgin of Phoebus, the girl god of the golden locks, granted a life that would never know a man's bed? Eros struck him with a barb of passion for the god frenzy girl. Daughter, throw down those sacred branches. Strip from your body this sacred woven dress. Is it not a great honor to obtain a king's bed? Why have you taken my youngest child from me? Where is she? Do you mean Polyxena or another girl? Polyxena? To what man was she yoked by her lot? She's been assigned to serve at Achilles' tomb. <sighs> Did I give birth to a grave attendant? Tell me, my good fellow, what Greek custom or ritual is this? Count your daughter blessed. She is happy. What is the meaning of these words? Tell me, does she look upon the light of the sun? She has found her lot in life. She is free of trouble. And... The wife of Hector, the husband who courted her with bronze, poor suffering Andromache. What is her fate? She too has been reserved. Achilles' son got her. And I, whom shall I serve? I who must walk with the cane in my shriveled hand. You were a part of the general lottery. You are awarded to Odysseus, lord of Ithaca. You are his slave. This is too much to bear. Strike now your head in mourning. Drag your nails over your cheeks. Is it then my lot to be the shadow of an abominable trickster, an enemy of the right, a rabid, lawless beast who with his forked tongue bends everything to its opposite and back again, making what was once loved hated, and what was once hated loved?
women, begin your lament for me. I have gone to my evil destiny. In my misery, I have fallen out. This is the most unfortunate lot of all. My, my queen, your Serving women, go! It is time to fetch Cassandra. Be quick! I must entrust her into the general's hands. And then I must bring the others allotted to their masters. What is this? Why is a torch blazing in the tent? What are the women of Troy doing? Do they wish to set their tents on fire because they do not wish to be taken from Troy to Argos? Do they wish to commit suicide by immolating themselves? In a crisis like theirs, the spirit of freedom bends a stiff neck to evils. Open the tent! I will not have what is good for these women, but hateful to the Achaeans get me in trouble. You are wrong. They are not lighting fires. In her divine frenzy, my daughter Cassandra is now rushing out to us. Take it. Carry the fire. I worship. I burn. Look! Look here! Lord Hymenaeus, this fire is sacred. <laughs> blessed is the bridegroom, and blessed I, who will be wed to a royal bed in the land of Argos. Hymen, Lord Hymenaeus! Since you, mother, are lamenting for my dead father and beloved fatherland with ceaseless tears and cries of grief, I myself will light the flame to spring a brilliant shaft of light at my marriage, offering it to you, Hymenaeus, <laughs> offering the torch to you, Hecate, to illuminate the marriage bed of virgins as custom bids. Let your feet spring into the air. Lead the line of dancers. Day and night since I call on you. You, mother, are celebrating my father's great blessed fortune. This is a sacred dance. You, Phoebus, lead it. I offer sacrifice in your palace among the laurels. Hymen, oh, Hymen, and oh! Dance, mother. Lead the chorus line. Come join me. Wind your step here with mine. Dear mother, stop here. Shout out the marriage hymn. I'm an A&O. With songs of praise and cries celebrating the bride. Come now, daughters of Phrygians, dress in your festival gowns. Dance. Sing the marriage hymn. Sing the groom. Destined for my bridal bed. Your Majesty, will you not stop your daughter? She is possessed by a god. Keep her from whirling in a dance to the camp of the Argos. Hephaestus, you hold the torches in the weddings of mortal men. But this flame you ignite gives off a grim light, something no one would have expected. Oh. Child, my child, I never thought would one day marry like this, driven at the point of an archive spear. Come, give me the torch. You're not holding it straight. But dart about like a minded, possessed. Child, your misfortunes have taught you nothing of restraint. You have not changed. Women, bring on the torches. Let your wailing be responsive to the wedding songs of this girl. Mother, crown my 
my head with the victor's wreath. Rejoice in my marriage to a king. Be my escort and my enthusiasm does not match yours. Force me to move. If Apollo Loxius is true to his name, glorious Agamemnon, great lord of the Achaeans, will marry in me a bride more disastrous than Helen. I will kill him and make him pay for the destruction of my brothers and father. I shall destroy his house. I say no more. We will not sing of the acts that will fall upon my neck and the necks of others. I will not sing of the struggle of matricides, a struggle my marriage will bring about, nor of the house of Atreus toppled. I shall demonstrate that this city is more fortunate than are the Achaeans. A god might possess me, but I shall stand this far distant from his pockets dance. The men who hunted down a single woman and in Helen, a single cupris, destroyed countless thousands. That commander, that sage man, lost all dearest to him for the sake of what is most hateful. Surrendering for the sake of his brother, the pleasures of children at home, and for the sake of a woman, a woman carried off not by force of violence, but by a willing partner. Yet, once they arrived on the banks of Scamander, the Achaeans began to die, not for land that had been taken from them, or home, or city with its lofty towers. Those that Ares destroyed never saw their children again. The hands of their wives did not wrap them in their funeral garments. They lie buried in a foreign land. Life in Greece mirrors life in Troy. Wives died off as widows. Fathers died after their sons, having raised children who would not care for them. Mother, hear the truth about the bitter fate of Hector. He enjoyed the reputation of being the bravest of men. He is now dead and gone. The coming of the Achaeans is responsible for his renown. Had they remained home, none would know his worth. And Paris, he married the daughter of Zeus. Had he not married, there would have been no word in Troy about this tie of kinship with a god. Anyone with any sense should avoid war, but if war comes, there is no shame in dying nobly for one's country. To die as a coward is a crown of infamy. For these reasons, mother, you should not mourn for our country or my coming marriage. By this, my marriage, I shall destroy those most loathed by you and me. Put what pleasure you take in the disasters of your home. The burden of this prophetic song will not be as compelling as you would have it. If Apollo had not driven you mad in Dionysus' frenzy, you would not be sending my commanders off this land with such sinister prophecies. So it is, what is exalted and wise in people's esteem collapses into ashes. The greatest lord of the assembled Greek forces, Atreus' beloved son, has been stricken with a passion for this dervish and preference to all others. I am a poor man, but I would not have chosen this woman for my bed. You, Cassandra, you are not in your right mind. I hurl all your curses upon the Achaeans and praise the Phrygians and to the raging winds. Come, follow me now to the ships, a lovely bride for the general. And as for you, whenever the son of Laertes wishes it, follow him. You will serve a good, prudent woman, so say those who come to Iliad. This man is a clever lackey. 
How do these men get their titles heralds? They are mere minions, creatures attached to tyrants and to cities. You. Do you bring the message my mother's to go to the halls of Odysseus? What has become then of the god Apollo's words? They declare she will die here. Unhappy man Odysseus does not know what sufferings await him. The day will come when he will look back on my sufferings and the sufferings of the Phrygians as a golden age. When he has added ten years to the ten years he has spent here, he will arrive at home alone. He will come first to the narrow passage between cliffs where the dread Charybdis dwells. I see the Cyclops, a mountain cannibal. I see Ligurian Circe, who transforms men into pigs. I see shipwrecks on the salt sea, the craving for the lotus, sacred cattle of the sun god, whose bleeding flesh will one day sing a bitter song that will make Odysseus's flesh crawl. I will cut my story short. Still living, he will enter Hades and once he survives shipwreck at sea, he will discover countless troubles on his return home. But why should I harp on the hardships of Odysseus? Get on your way! Join our bridegroom in the Hall of Hades! That coward will be given a coward's burial at night, not in the light of day. You, commander of Danaeans, not Danaeans, of women, not men, you fancy you are accomplishing some magnificent feat. And I, my corpse, cast down naked the deep ravines as they run in winter torrent, will yield up to beasts to share near the tomb of my groom, I, Apollo's priestess. Where's the general ship? Which ship must I board? You need not wait for a breeze to fill the sails. In me, you are transporting from this land a fury. A single avenger of three crimes. <laughs> Mother, do not say goodbye. Beloved country, brothers beneath its soil, father who sired us. In a short time you will greet me. I shall arrive among the dead of Victor when I have destroyed the Atreides who have destroyed us. <laughs> I have the right to 
brave and allies. Even so, there is a kind of propriety in calling on you when one of us mortals meets misfortune. First, now, it is my pleasure to sing of our blessings, for by their contrast I will impart an even more tragic strain to our disasters. Yes, I was born to royalty and destined to it. As queen, I gave birth to children who excelled all others. And not in their mere number did they stand above all other Phrygians. No mother, Trojan, Greek, or barbarian, could have a boast as I do over my son. These sons are so far under the arms of the Greeks. Over their graves did I crop this head in mourning, and I wept for Priam who sired them. No one had to tell me of his death, for I witnessed it with these eyes. Butchered! A sapling at the altar of our hearth! And I saw Troy captured. Daughters I brought up to be the choice brides of the most eligible suitors were raised for other husbands, snatched from my hands. There's no hope that they will ever see me again, or that I will ever again set eyes upon them. As for the rest of my life story, the miserable conclusion is this. I shall arrive in Greece in my old age as a slave. My masters will assign me tasks not at all fitting for a woman of my age. To hold keys as a doorkeeper. The mother of Hector. To grind a meal and sleep with my back on a hard floor and ache. Oh. My body will be covered with rags over one's fine robes. A disgrace for all those who were once well-to-do. I'm so miserable! And the wedding of one woman has caused all of this and will continue to cause more grief. Cassandra. My child, dancing wildly with the gods. What catastrophes have loosened the belt of your purity. And you, my poor girl, Polyxena, where are you? Of all the children of this fruitful womb, what son or daughter is here now to help me? Lead me in the dance. Lead my foot once so delicate and dry. Now that I am a slave, lead me to a straw bed on a dirt floor. With this stone fell over my queen's tiara. I... I am fallen. Uh, women count no mortal man or woman. Happy before death arrives. The 
people of Troy shouted to heaven, Go out now, you men who are now at the end of your suffering! Draw this sacred wooden image up to the virgin goddess of Ilion, daughter of Zeus. Was there a young woman who did not go out into the streets? Was there an old man who did not leave his home? They all felt joy in their festive songs, and in their delusion they bent under slavery's yoke. <laughs> the entire nation of Phrygia rushed to the gates, to the horrors of mountain pine, to the woodcrafted ambush of the Argives, in their eagerness to offer this bane to the goddess of Dardanus' land, a thanks offering to the unyoked goddess of the immortal foals. With robes of plated flax they drew it, like some black ship soon to stain their country with blood, to the stone seat and foundation of Pallas Athena, the dark of night settled on their labor and joy. The lotus wood pipes of Libya throbbed out tremulous Phrygian airs. And the young women responded to the rhythm with the beat of their feet and lifted their festal songs. But in their homes, fierce tongues of fire gave a black glint to sleep. I, for my part, danced in a chorus within my chambers and was singing the mountain ranging daughter of Zeus when a blood-curdling shout crested over the high battlements of Troy. Babes in arms, clutched with hands, trembling with terror, the robes of their mothers, and Ares began to emerge from ambush in the work that was the work of the virgin palace. There was slaughter about the altars of the sanctuary, the cropped hair, the desolation of young widows, carrying a wreath of the fertility to Greece and her young, but black mourning for the country of the Phrygians. Hecuba, can you see Andromache being transported in this foreign cart? Little Astyanax, Hector's son, rocks to the heaving motion of his mother's breast. Unlucky woman, where are they taking you away from Troy? Mounted on this carriage with Hector's armor and the spoils of Phrygia that are the prizes of the hunt in war. These trophies, the son of Achilles, will hang on the temples of Phythia. My masters, the Achaeans are taking me away. <gasps> Why do you groan this hymn of my triumph? Hi, hi. You groan for our pain. Oh, Zeus! You groan for our ruin. My children. We were once your children. Gone is our good fortune. God is joy. Poor, poor woman. Gone the noble ancestry of our children. <laughs> City, a city now smoldering. My husband, come to me. You call out to my son, poor woman. He is in Hades. Come, protect your wife. I call on you once the curse of the Achaeans. I call on you, ancient Priam, lord of our children. Take me into the halls of Hades. Mine is a deep longing. You are adamant. We feel these pains. Pain for a city that is no more. Pain heaped on pain. Pain caused by the hostility of the gods from the time your son first escaped Hades. Son who, for an abominable marriage, destroyed the citadel of Troy. Now bodies of the dead lie exposed at the temple of divine palace. Vultures will pick their bones. Athena has put Troy under slavery's yoke. Troy, my desolate land! You are abandoned. I weep for you. Now we can see its tragic end. You can see the house where I gave birth. My children, your mother who has lost her city is now abandoned. 
abandoned by you. <laughs> Tears drip down in an unending stream. Shrill is the morning over our house is destroyed. The dead are dead to our pain. <laughs> Yes, tears are sweet to those in trouble, and the heart-rending strain of lamentation, and the muse of suffering. Another to the hero Hector, who killed more Argives than any other Trojan. Do you see these spoils of war? What I see is the work of the god. They raise up to towering heights what was once nothing. Uh, and what seems to tower above us, do they destroy? <laughs> I and my son are being carried off as plunder. <laughs> Subject to these laws of change, nobility has been reduced to slavery. Force is the most terrible thing about necessity. My daughter Cassandra has just gone from me, dragged away by brute force. <laughs> So it seems that another was Ajax to your daughter, but your sickness spread still further. There is no end to my sickness, no term. When disaster comes to fly with another. Your daughter Polyxena is now dead. She was slaughtered, a victim at the grave of Achilles, an offering to a lifeless corpse. <laughs> I got down from the wagon, covered her with a robe, and mourned over her body. <laughs> my child, my child, you were the first victim of your abominable rights. I cry out in grief for your terrible death. She died as she died. Even so, her fate was kinder than mine. I must go on living. To look upon the light of day is not the same as death. Death is nothing. In life, hope still lives. I say that to have never been born is the same as being dead. It is better to be dead than to live a life of distress. The dead are done with suffering and feel absolutely no pain. But the person who has experienced good fortune and falls into ill fortune is distraught at the thought of lost happiness. Polyxena is now dead. It's as if she had never seen the light of day. She knows nothing of the evils that have befallen her. But I, I who set my sights on the target of a good reputation, who had my share of the goods of fortune, I missed my mark. For all those qualities that are admirable in a woman were the object of my constant striving while I served under Hector's roof. First and foremost, I kept inside the house. Whether or not there exists real cause for gossip, a woman who does not stay indoors attracts a bad reputation simply by going out. I gave up all longing for the world outdoors and did not admit into my chambers the sophisticated talk of women. My native good sense tutored me. I did not need the company of other women. these excellent qualities reached the Achaean camp and destroyed me. <laughs> when it came to the distribution of the women set apart, the son of Achilles chose me as his wife. <laughs> I will live as a slave in the house of murderers. <laughs> if I thrust from me the beloved head of Hector and open my heart to my new husband, people will think I'm a traitor to my husband. But if I loathe my new husband, my masters will hate me. And yet they say a single night melts a woman's resistance to a man's bed. I scorn the woman who rejects her former husband for the bed and love of another. There is no filly who can easily pull the yoke from the filly she has been reared with. Yet a brute beast is born with no language. Having no intelligence, a beast is inferior to human beings. In you, Hector, I had the husband I wanted. You were great in intelligence, nobility, 
wealth and courage. <laughs> when you took me from my father's house, I knew no man. You were the first to yoke me as a bride in your bed. <laughs> Now, Hector, you are gone. <laughs> but I will be carried as a captive of war on a ship to Greece and the yoke of slavery. <laughs> Does not then Polixenus' death, which you lament so grievously, hold fewer evils than my life? I do not even have hope as my companion. Hope the companion of all other mortals. I am not deluded. I am set on no noble course. But it is sweet to think so. You have reached the same depth of misfortune as have I. In your lamentation, you have taught me the extent of my own pain. I have never set foot on a ship, but I know ships. I have seen paintings of them, and I have heard about them. If sailors should enjoy moderate weather, they are confident that they can escape difficulties. One is stationed at the rudder, another at the mast, and another mans the bilge pump. But if a heavy sea should rage and break over the ship, the crew surrenders itself to fortune and commits itself to the running of the waves. Such a sailor am I. Many are my troubles. I cannot utter a word. I surrender my powers of speech. The disastrous surge of some God-sent storm overwhelms me. Enough of that. My dear child, do not dwell for much on Hector's fate. Your tears cannot save him now. Rather, show respect to your present owner and master. Dangle before him the lure and charm of your good behavior. If you do as I say, you will bring comfort to all your loved ones. And you will perhaps one day raise this boy, son of my son, to be the salvation of Troy. Sons of your sons will found Ilion once again, and once again Troy will become a city. One thought does beget another. What do I see here? Is the Achaean's lackey coming to proclaim still new decisions? Andromache, you are the wife of the man who was once the most heroic of the Phrygians. Do not hate me for what I have to say. It is not my choice to bring messages of the Danaeans and family of the Pelops. What is this message? This is a prelude to some evil tale. The army has voted that this boy how can I say it? No, he won't be the slave of another master than mine. No Achaean will ever be his master. Then will they leave him in Troy as the last remnant of the Phrygians? I know of no great way to tell you evil. I respect your decent hesitation unless what you have to say is evil. To tell you the evil truth, they mean to kill your son. <sighs> evil greater than what you've said about my marriage. <laughs> Odysseus prevailed in his speech before the Greek assembly. He said, There is no end to the evil we suffer. He said we should not let the son of a heroic father grow into manhood. I wish he would prevail on the army to sentence his own son to the same fate. The decision was that this boy will be thrown from the towers of Troy. Andromache, let this be. Be wise and accept it. Do not cling to the boy. Bear the pain of your adversity with nobility. Do not believe you have any strength when you have no power. Consider as you must, you have already lost your city and your husband. For these reasons, do not be eager for combat. And I will not have you hurl curses upon the Achaeans. If you utter a single word to enrage the army, this boy will receive no burial, none of the rights of the mourning for the dead. But if you keep your quiet and manage your misfortunes as best you can, then perhaps this boy 
may yet not go unburied, and you yourself may find the Achaeans better disposed to you. of your enemies, leaving your mother to her sorrows. The noble birth of your father has been the cause of your undoing. For others, this nobility proved their salvation. Your father's nobility came too early for you. My nuptials and my marriage were doomed. Doomed the house of Hector, which I first entered as a bride, with no thought that the son I bore would become victim of the Danaeans. I thought he would monarch over all fertile Asia. Child, you're weeping. Do you sense your misfortunes? Why are you clinging to me, holding on to my robe like a baby bird quivering under its mother's wings? Hector will not rise up to come beneath the earth, gripping his spear and save you. You have no protection in your father's family or the might of the Phrygians. You will hurtle pitifully from the heights in a dead plunge and break your neck. Your soul will break out from your body. Let me embrace your dear young body and smell your skin's sweet breath. So, all my hopes were vain that this breast nursed you when you were a babe in swaddling clothes. All my care, all the labor that wore me out were for nothing. Now come, wrap your arms around me, kiss me, child. Come to the mother who gave you life. You civilized Greeks, with your evil barbaric inventions, why kill this boy? He did nothing to you. And you, daughter of Tyndareus, you were never the daughter of Zeus. I say that you are the spawn of many fathers. Avenge first, then spite, gore, blood, and death. All the crop of evil earth yields begot you. I will never take pride in claiming that Zeus was your father. For many a Greek and many a barbarian, you are the black death spirit. I wish you dead. The gleaming light in your lovely eyes has destroyed in ugly fashion the famous plains of Troy. Now go, take your plunder, carry it away with you. Throw it down if this is your decision. Feast on this child's flesh. The gods I know will our utter destruction and we Trojans could never shelter him from death. Cover this tormented body and take it to the ship. I'm headed for a splendid wedding celebration now that I've lost my child. Poor suffering Troy, because of a single woman and a loathsome marriage, you have lost countless thousands. Come, son, leave the arms of your sorrowful mother and mount to the towers of your ancestors, the crown of your city, where it is decreed you shall breathe your last. <laughs> Take him away. It is the duty of a better friend than I to our shameful decisions to make proclamations such as this. What 
will become of me? What can I do for you, doomed child? We can give you these gestures of mourning as we beat our hands and breasts of mourning and lamentation. We are masters. I cry out for our city. I cry out for you. What now do we lack? What more do we need to bring us into utter destruction? Oh, Telamon, king of Salamis, land flowering with bees, you established your home and seat on an island washed by beating waves, facing the sacred slope where Athena first revealed the spring of the olive, green and gray, a celestial crown and jewel for bright, prosperous Athens, Salamis. You left, you left with the archer son of Mini to share in all the exploits for Alien, for Alien to destroy our city. What was once our city when you came from Greece? When Heracles first led the flower of Greece, dishonored as he was over the broken promise of the horses, he brought ships that cleaved the sea to rest on the divine herd of the Samoys and tied them prow up to the shore. He they took from his ships a cargo of arrows, sure of their mark to carry death to Laomidon. Then he raised the walls, built straight to Apollo's plumb and rule, and with a crimson blast of fire, he destroyed the land of Troy. Twice, in twin strokes around Troy's walls, did the land stained with blood overthrow the walls of Dardanos. Eros, god of passion, once you came to the halls of King Dardanos. The eyes of the goddesses of heaven were upon you. How high did you then make Troy tower as you joined Troy in kinship with the gods? But I will say, say nothing, nothing in this praise of Zeus. This light of the goddess of the dawn, carried on pale wings, light dear to men, gazed upon the land as a destructive flame, saw the destruction of its citadels. The goddess of the dawn, Eos, kept to her chambers as she saw this. A husband from his land, the father of her sons, was, was carried away in a chariot of stars, the source of high hope for his native land. But for the gods, Troy holds no more charms. This light of the sun is a fair blaze. This is the day I will lay hands on my wife. I came to Troy not, as people think, because of a woman, but to confront the man who, as a guest in my house, deceived me and stole my wife from my house. Now that man has, with the God's help, paid the penalty for his crime. Yes, he and his country, which has fallen to Greek arms. I have come to take away the Spartan woman. It gives me no pleasure to pronounce the name of the woman who was once my wife. I know that she is in these captive quarters, tallied out along with the other women of Troy. The fighting men who suffered such hardship to take her at spear point have given her to me to kill. Or if I do not kill her, and it is my wish, to take her back with me to Argos. It is my decision not to kill Helen here at Troy. Rather, I will take her by ship to Greek soil and give her over for execution there in requital for all my friends who died in Troy. Now men, go to her quarters. 
Bring her to me. Drag her by her bloody hair. When the breeze is freshened from the east, we will take her to Greece. You, you who bear the weight of the earth and have your seat upon the earth, whoever you are, hard to know and hard to place, Zeus, whether you are the necessity of nature or human intelligence, you do I call upon. As you travel your silent course, you lead all things human on the path to justice. What is this? This is a strange new manner of praying to the gods. Menelaus, you have earned my praise if you mean to kill your wife. But be careful not to look at her. Helen is hell. She will make you captive with desire. She turns men's eyes. She overturns cities. She burns men's homes. So powerful are Helen's charms. I know her, as do you and her other victims. Menelaus, this rude treatment announces some dreadful thing. Your men have laid hands on me and have dragged me out here in front of the tent. I, I am nearly certain that you hate me. But I would like to say something. I want to ask, what have you and the Greeks decided? Will I live or die? It was no close decision. The army voted unanimously to surrender you to me to put to death. I am the man you wronged. Am I permitted to respond to this sentence and say, if I die, we die unjustly? I have not come to argue with you. I have come to kill you. Menelaus, let her speak so that she will not die without a hearing, and let us refute her. You know nothing of the troubles inside Troy, but the sum of these together and the argument will mean her death. She will never be acquitted. We have time, and the time is yours. If she wants to speak, she can. But understand it is only to hear what you have to say that I allow her to speak, not for her sake. Perhaps because you believe that I am your enemy, you will refuse to reply to me whether you think I speak well or badly. But I will reply to you by anticipating the charges that you will lodge against me in your speech. First, then, I say that when that woman gave birth to Paris, she produced the beginning of troubles. Second, Old Priam destroyed both Troy and me when he failed to kill the infant. This Alexander had to judge a triad of three goddesses. The bribe of Pallas Athena to Alexander was to grant him the destruction of Greece as commander of the Phrygians. If Paris should choose Hera over the other gods, she promised him Asia, an absolute rule over all of Europe. And Cupris, who was astounded by my beauty, promised me as a reward if she outstripped the other goddesses in beauty. Consider how the tale now turns. Cupris was victorious over the other goddesses. And this victory is the great good my marriage did for Greece. You are not subject to barbarians. You were not defeated in battle, nor did you fall under a tyranny. All of this was Greece's great good fortune. But this was the cause of my undoing. I was destroyed by my beauty. And I am blamed for acts for which I deserve a victor's crown placed upon my head. You will say that I have not yet stated the obvious. I stole away from your house in secret. 
Paris came to your house accompanied by no mean goddess as my avenging demon. Call him Alexander the Defender if you like, or Paris the Destroyer. You craven coward! This is the man you left at home in Sparta while you sailed off to Crete! I have made my point. I will speak next not of you, but of myself. Tell me, how could I have run away from your house with a strange man and betrayed home and country were I in my right mind? Chastise the goddess, not me, and become stronger than Zeus. Zeus wields power over all the other gods, but he is the slave of this goddess. There is no reason to blame me. As the tale continues, you might have a plausible charge against me. You could claim that once Alexander had died and entered the hollows of the earth, I should have left his house and gone down to the ships of the Argives. At that time, my marriage was not compassed by a god. This is exactly what I tried to do. I have as my witnesses the guards at the city gates and the watchmen on the ramparts. Time after time, they discovered me trying to steal away lowering my body from the battlements to the ground on twisted sheets. Tell me, my husband, why do I deserve to be put to death for this? You would commit an injustice if you did. My last husband forced me to marry him. And my life within Troy was a life of bitter servitude, not the life of a victor. If you wish to be stronger than the gods, you are living in a fool's paradise. Your majesty, come to face your children and your country. Demolish this woman's specious arguments. She's a bad woman who speaks well. And this alarms me. I will first come to the defense of the three goddesses as their ally. I will demonstrate that there is no justice in what Helen says. I do not think that Hera and the Virgin Palace could have ever been so ignorant. Why would Hera want to barter her Argos to barbarians? Why would Athena want to enslave her Athenians to Phrygians? These goddesses did not come to Mount Ida for some childish contest in peacock pride over their rival beauties. What could Hera, a goddess, have to be so enamored of her beauty? Did she want to get a husband better than Zeus? <laughs> Was Athena hunting for a husband among the gods? It was Athena who, in her aversion to marriage, begged her father for the gift of virginity. Do not make fools of the gods to beautify your ugly vice. Do not think you can persuade the wise. You claim that Cupris, and this is laughable, accompanied my son to the halls of Menelaus as if she could not remain content to stay in heaven and dragged you to Ilion along with the settlement of Amaclon. My son was a very, very handsome boy, but it was your own mind that turned to Cupris at the sight of him. When you first set eyes on my son and were dazzled by his easy hat dress and gold, you became frenzied with lust. And once you were away from Sparta, you fancied that the Phrygian capital flowed with gold and would shower you with luxuries. The halls of Menelaus were not big enough to hold you and your pampered lifestyle. But enough on that point. 
Next, you claim that my son dragged you here by violence. What Spartan ever knew of this act of violence? When did you ever let out a shriek? Young Castor and his twin brother were still alive and had not yet ascended to the stars. But when you reached Troy with the Argives at your heels, the struggle and agony began and then fell to the spear. When report reached you that Menelaus here was prevailing, you were all praised for Menelaus to pain my son with the thought that he had a serious rival for your love. But if the Trojans were fortunate in battle, this man here was nothing to you. Your practice was to keep your eye on fortune and to follow her. Virtue you were never willing to follow. Your next point. You claim that you stole away from Troy, lowering yourself from the towers using plated sheets? <laughs> Tell me, when were you ever discovered hanging by a rope or sharpening the blade of a sword? Any decent woman would have killed herself in logging for her former husband. Many was the time when I went to you and said, Daughter, leave Troy. My sons can find other women to marry. I will help smuggle you out. I will take you down to the ships of the Achaeans. Put an end to this war between the Achaeans and us Trojans. But you found my good advice a bitter pill. You lived proud and peevish in the house of Alexander. You wanted the Orientals to prostrate themselves before you. All of this was important to you. And afterwards, you appeared in public like this, beautifully dressed and carefully made up. And you look upon the same sky as your husband. I could spit on you! You ought to have come out humble with your eyes to the ground and the torn garments of a widow! With your hair shorn in a city in fashion and a becoming modesty to outweigh your past shamelessness, contrived for all your past errors! Now, Menelaus, know how my speech will conclude. Crown Greece with a wreath of victory. Be worthy of yourself. Kill that woman and lay it down as a law for all other women. The wife who betrays her husband dies. Yes, Menelaus, prove yourself worthy of your ancestors and your house. Punish your wife! Do not let Greece call you an exorious coward. Even to your enemies you will appear noble. Hecuba, your argument coincides with my own. That woman willingly left my house for an adulterer's bed. And she brought Cupris into her speech out of sheer vanity. You, go face the men who will stone you to death. By a quick death, you'll repay the long sufferings of the Achaeans. This will teach you not to shame me. No, Menelaus, don't. I beseech you, I fall to your knees. Do not blame me for an act that is sent by the gods. Forgive me. Do not betray the comrades that woman killed. I implore you by their deaths and the deaths of my children. Old woman enough said, I care nothing for her. I am ordering my attendants to take her down to the ships ready to depart. She will board ship. Wait, do not let her board ship. Why not? Has she put on weight? <laughs> Once in love, always a lover, as the proverb has it. Do you wish to give my mind some distance from the object of its affection? I will do as you say. It makes sense. She will not board the same ship as we. 
But when she reaches Argos, this shameless woman will die a shameful death and teach all of womankind a lesson in restraint. This is no easy lesson. Even so, the fate of this woman will instill fear into their love-crazed hearts, even if they are more shameless than she. of Achilles to the coast of Pythia. Neapolitanus himself has already set sail. He received word of some trouble involving Peleus. It seems Acostos, Peleus' son, has driven him from his land. This is why he left so soon. He could not delay. He is gone, and Andromache went with him. She was a tragic sight. I wept as I saw her leaving her country, lamenting her land and calling out towards Hector's tomb. She asked Neapolitanus to bury this child. The son of your Hector fell from the walls and his soul broke out from his body. She asked him not to take this shield. The shield that made the Achaeans turn in flight. This bronze back shield that the boy's father kept about his sides. To the hearth of Peleus or the chamber she would enter as a bride. She wanted him buried in this shield and no cedar chest or rings of stone. She asked us to bring him to you. Once you have dressed the corpse in death's finery and we have wrapped him in the fold of the earth, we will sail. Do what you've been ordered to do as quickly as you can. I have already spared you one labor. As I crossed the Scamander, I washed the body in its waters and cleansed its bloody wounds. I am going now. I will dig a grave for the boy. Once we have completed our tasks, and we must be quick, we will launch our ship and sail home. It is a grievous sight that gives me no pleasure. Oh, Achaeans! Your spears have more heft than your light mines. Why did you fear this 
child. <laughs> Why did you devise this new form of death? Were you afraid that he would one day raise up fallen Troy? When Hector was fortunate in battle, we women were perishing. And now that Troy has been captured and the people of Phrygia have been destroyed, do you actually fear this small babe? I cannot admire anyone who feels fear, but does not reflect on the grounds of his fear. Dearest child, I grieve the terrible way death came upon you. Had you died for your city, having grown to manhood, to marriage, to kingship, which makes men equal to the gods, you would have had a blessed life. If any of these things here is blessed. <laughs> Take this to adorn the broken body of the boy. Our lesser God gives us nothing of beauty in our misfortunes. Take this. It is all we have. That mortal is a fool who takes joy in his prosperity, thinking it will last him forever. The highs and lows of our life are a lunatic that lurches from place to place. No man can control his own fortune. Uh, here now are the women carrying a robe from the plunder of Troy to place upon his body. Child, the mother of your father places this robe over you and this crown, part of treasures once yours. You were never victorious over your peers in horse races or contests of archery. Competitions of Phrygians pride, but not in excess. No. Helen, that Helen loathed by the gods, has murdered you! Has taken your life from you and destroyed your heart and home! dress you in the fine robe you should have worn at your wedding when you married the noblest of the daughters of the east. I fit to your body this rich embroidered robe woven by Phrygian women. And you, once triumphant mother of many victories, the shield that was once a part of Hector, received your victor's crown. You are not immortal. You will not die with this body. You are more precious by far than the arms won by that clever coward, Odysseus. Oh, child, the earth will receive you. You are the bitter well of our grief and lamentation. Mother, join us in our bitter song. You cry for the dead. these wrappings. I, a healer who suffers, who am called a healer, but can heal nothing. Your other needs your father will care for in the netherworld. Strike, strike our temples, blow after blow. You are most dear to me. And you must speak. What do you want to say to us? <laughs> so, so, the gods never really cared at all. <laughs> or if they cared, they cared for my suffering and for the suffering of Troy, the city they picked out for their special hate. <laughs>
So we offered them lavish sacrifices of oxen for nothing. <laughs> Yet, had not some god turned our world upside down and buried our towers in the earth, we would have been ciphers. We would have never been the subject of song or provided an argument for the muse of mortal poets yet to be born. Go now, bury this body in this poor trench. He has all the finery the dead require. I think the dead pay little heed to lavish grave goods. They are the hollow ostentations of the living. Stand there with fire flickering in your hands. Torch the city. Once we have reduced the city of Ilion to ashes, we can set sail home from Troy. And as for you, daughters of Trojans, start moving out. When the general gives the shrill blast of the trumpet, head down to the ships of the Achaeans to be taken from this land. And you, old woman, most unfortunate of all these women, come along. These men have been sent by Odysseus. You are his prize of war, and you will be his slave in Ithaca. <laughs> this comes as the crown of all of my sufferings. I leave the land of my birth. Troy is now in flames. <laughs> Body, legs slow with age, make this effort now. I want to say a last farewell to my suffering city. Troy, Troy, once you held your head so high among the peoples of the East, soon you will be stripped of your name and fame. You to the torch. They are taking us women away from this land as slaves. Gods! Gods! But why should I call upon the gods? In the past, they have not listened when we called upon them. Now, let us race to the funeral pyre of Troy. It would be a noble death to perish in the flames of my burning land. Unhappy woman, you are possessed by the demon of your sufferings. Take her away. Do not delay. She must be entrusted into Odysseus, his hand. Oh, now my trembling limbs tremble. Take me away. Take me away. My life is a slave. Oh, <laughs> my